Hello, and welcome back to On The Go with BCSO. I'm your host, Corporal Dave Jacobs, and there's a lot of great things happening with your Sheriff's Office, which I'm excited to share. Before we begin, I'd like to address the violence I'm sure we've all seen in the media lately, much of which is directed towards law enforcement. I'm happy to say the citizens of Brevard County have continued to show overwhelming support for their law enforcement officers, and we would like to say thank you. We love our community and the people we serve, and we truly appreciate knowing you support our efforts. You've probably noticed how packed the gym is at the start of the year. For most Americans, fitness is at the top of the list of New Year's resolutions. Looking and feeling your best are great goals, but have you ever wondered what the fitness requirements are to become a deputy sheriff or corrections deputy? Before becoming a deputy sheriff or corrections deputy, every candidate must perform a physical abilities test, better known as the PAT. The primary goal of this testing is to determine whether the applicant is capable of performing minimum standards appropriate for this line of work. The battery of job-related field tests is intended to be completed in the fastest possible time and will require maximum effort by the applicant. These tests are designed to measure balance, muscular endurance, strength, flexibility, capacity of anaerobic power, fine motor skills, and even aerobic conditioning. The test includes two 220-yard runs, dragging a 150-pound object over 100 feet, jumping over obstacles 12 to 24 inches high, climbing over a wall 40 inches high, and movement around a series of pylons. The tough part, though, is getting through the entire course in just under four minutes. Although it sounds complicated and you heard the requirements, let's take a look at the course. In an effort to maintain top physical standards and conditioning to perform the functions and demands as a law enforcement officer, the Sheriff's Office provides its employees with a variety of fitness opportunities. There are four gyms available at precincts throughout the county so that all the employees can exercise at their daily duty stations or a precinct close to home. Continuing fitness is essential for our personnel to remain best of the best. We even incorporate a unique kind of fitness for our personnel. Let's take a look. In 2013, jail records manager Jessica Van Atta, who was already a spin instructor, brought the program to the jail complex. In 2014, additional instructors were recruited and senior staff assistant Don Del Duca, crew supervisor Tracy Jenkins, Sergeant Kimberly Moore, accountant Yvonne Nicholas, and director Steve Salvo all became certified instructors. Spin classes provide the opportunity to incorporate several different moves and high intensity interval cardio training while listening to some of your favorite music and burning 300 to 500 calories within a 45 minute class. Because the spin bike is designed a little differently than a stationary bike, it allows you to control the tension, the ability to stand, and to move at a faster pace, all while using different muscles in your legs, arms, and abs. It's a great way to reduce stress, lose weight, add muscle tone, and have a lot of fun. 
Each instructor has their own style, and we offer several classes at the jail and the Titusville office. All employees and their family members are allowed to attend classes free of charge. In addition to being physically fit, there is a lot of training that goes into joining our ranks. One of the most important steps for a new deputy is passing the field training program when he or she is first hired. A brand new deputy doesn't just jump into a patrol car and hit the streets. In fact, they spend nearly their first year undergoing rigorous evaluations to make sure they are the best of the best and fit for this type of work. Our FTOs, or field training officers, are an integral part of evaluating every new deputy's skills and making sure that they are ready before assuming the task and responsibility of keeping you and your family safe. We are extremely proud of the performance of our FTOs and every deputy remembers lessons learned from their FTOs throughout their entire career. I can still vividly remember valuable lessons by my first field training officer as she's now a lieutenant within the agency. I can still remember she was firm but fair and constantly stressed professional excellence and service to the community. Officer safety being of course the first priority, but she constantly asserted the need for legitimate care for each and every citizen that calls for service. I thank Lieutenant Joanna Siegel for teaching me very valuable lessons which I still use to help assure success in my career today. Now I'd like to share a special story with you from our patrol division. I caught up with Deputy Chelsea Holliday, who responded to a suspicious vehicle call that turned into more than she had originally thought. So Chelsea, you self-initiated a call not too long ago of a suspicious incident. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Uh, I was on routine patrol in Merritt Island um, in Kiwanis Island Park. I saw a van that was parked there after dusk. Uh, we, we routinely check the parks in Merritt Island. We have a lot of people that will park there and do things they're not supposed to do at night. And so I knocked on the window. There was a man and a woman sleeping in the van. And I asked for their identification. And the woman looked at me and said, I don't have identification. So I thought, OK, you know, what's your name and date of birth? That happens all the time. But she refused to talk to me for like the, ne the rest of the time I dealt with her, actually. She completely shut down and wouldn't speak with me. Um, she, the man that she was with knew that her name was, she went by Ingrid and that she was homeless in the Naples area of Florida, but that was all he knew. He mm. said that she had also mentioned uh, sustaining some type of head injury, but he just picked her up and he says was just giving her a ride even though he didn't have any reason for her to be in Brevard County. Um, after about two hours, brought some supervisors in, tried to identify the woman. She still wouldn't speak with us. He didn't know enough about her for us to identify her. She didn't have any identification on her ended up arresting her for obstruction. So you ended up having to take her to jail for resisting an obstruction and book her into the jail as a Jane Doe because you couldn't identify her. Yeah, and that happens, but normally when that happens it's somebody has a warrant for their arrest or they're missing and they don't want to be found. And this woman, it was just very bizarre. It seemed like maybe she was hiding something. She was very confused, but she could understand what we were saying. You know, she spoke English. She would nod and shake her head to our yes or no questions, but she refused to tell us who she was. Now, did that raise any red flags to you? Yeah, and what worried me most was taking a woman to jail for something, a misdemeanor charge like obstruction, and she would have to sit into the, in the jail until she identifies herself. So what are some things that you did after that, you know, to help identify her? Um, that night, I sent a couple teletypes over. He said she was, he picked her up in Naples, so I sent Naples Police Department a message saying, um, you know, we have this Jane Doe and her demographics. I also sent them to call your county sheriff's office because that's the county Naples is in. Now, you didn't get a response right away from them, did you? No, and then I, you know, we also sent out a bulletin through our agency with her, with her photo to try and identify her. But a couple weeks later, a Naples Police Department analyst contacted me. She sent me an email and said, hey, I found this, this woman. Her name is Ingrid Beatty. Uh, she was and sent me her date of birth and stuff. And he, she said she was civilly committed in Naples um, for mental problems. So how did you use that information now and, or, or then to positively identify her? I sent Ingrid Beatty's information to an analyst with our sheriff's office and she was able to find a driver's license out of Minnesota for an Ingrid Beatty, sent me the driver's license photo, and it was her. Oh. Yeah. So, so what did you do after that? Um, after I positively identified her through the driver's license photo, 
you know, she's still in jail at this time. So I was like, well, I'll try to contact. Usually states have an emergency contact with your driver's license. And it was her son, Jeremy Beatty. So I called him on the phone and was like, you know, do you know what's going on with your mother? She's homeless down here in Naples. And he said, I don't even know where she's been. He said, I've been looking for her for over a year. What was his initial reaction? He was shocked. Actually, he, he thought that she might have passed away. He had no idea what had happened to her. Uh, he thought maybe she just didn't want anything to do with him or her family. And he was just stunned, actually. He, he was speechless at first, and then, and then we started out. So his mother had been missing for over a year. And now here we are. He's, he's getting contact by you. Um, how, did you how did you coordinate it to get him reunited? Well, at first he didn't even believe that I was a police officer, <laughs> so he called the sheriff's office and confirmed that I was a deputy. Um, I put him in contact with our state attorney's office, and um, he drove down to her next uh, hearing um, and picked her up. The state attorney's office released her into his custody, um, telling her that she probably needed to get some mental health evaluation now. And uh, for her, what happened was she actually ended up sustaining a traumatic brain injury. Wow in Naples. She was found on the sidewalk by a group of people and spent time in the hospital. And she actually owns a house in Naples. Wow. And what happened, I guess every so often she would wander away from her house. And the last time that she wandered, she never found her way back to her house and was picked up by the random guy that I found in Kiwanis Island Park. Wow. That's fantastic. So now since they've been reunited, how is she doing? Uh, she's doing really well. I spoke with Jeremy the other night. He said that she's starting to remember more of her life. She definitely, um, she doesn't know what happened to her head. She doesn't know how she sustained the, the brain injury. But she was reunited the other day with her parents who are in their 80s. She hadn't seen them in 22 years. Wow. Um, obviously, that was from her own choices. But when she went back home, she decided she wanted to rekindle that relationship. Well, that's fantastic. Chelsea, we really appreciate you. This is a, this is a prime example of, of a deputy going well out of your means and way to, uh, to assure the safety of our citizens and, and uh, of our county. So we really appreciate you, and thanks for doing such a good job. Oh, thank you so much. Hello, my name is Sergeant Carlos Reyes with the Brevard County Sheriff's Office Homicide Unit. We are seeking the public assistance in resolving some unsolved homicides in our county. On May 24, 1971, around 8.30 p.m., the victim, Brenda Riley, 13 years of age, left her residence on Melbourne Avenue in Merritt Island, Brevard County, Florida, to go to a nearby store three blocks away to purchase a gift for her sister's birthday. Her father reported her missing around 10 p.m. when she did not return home. Search of the area was conducted, but met with negative results. On May 27th, a lawn maintenance worker discovered the victim's body in an overgrown field east of State Road 3 and south of Catalina Isles Boulevard in Mary Island. According to witnesses, the victim was last seen in the company of a Caucasian male, 18 to 20 years of age, at a local convenience store near the crime scene on the evening of May 24th. We are urging the public, if they have any information, to please call the Brevard County Sheriff's Homicide Unit at 321-633-8413 or email us at majorcrimes at bcso.us or call Crime Line at 1-800-423-TIPS if you wish to remain anonymous. Thank you. For the next On The Go with BCSO, we would like to have some input from you. What would you like to know about your Brevard County Sheriff's Office? Are there any places you would like to see on the go? We know you've got some great ideas, so send us an email at onthego at bcso.us. Thanks for watching and join us next time as we are On The Go with BCSO.